very much. Um, I realise that the title is probably a little stronger uh, than I intended. You could probably put all sorts of different things and claim that they're really the root of the disagreement between Camus and Sartre. But what I want to say um, in this paper is that the famous dispute between Camus and Sartre um, uh, over the nature of political violence or the, the role of violence in, in politics uh, in the 1950s has its root in a, or has a root, in uh, a disagreement between them um, about the nature of human existence and a, and a disagreement that is uh, evident, I think, in the relationship between uh, L'Etranger and uh, L'Etre Le Niort. Um, so, contrary to Sartre's own account of what's going on in this fight, and a lot of other people's uh, too, it's not the case that Camus in some way changes his mind or abandons some central tenet of existentialism that he formally uh, subscribed to, it's rather that um, the basic disagreement between Sartre and Camus that was always there becomes played out in this uh, political forum um, when it was never really addressed uh, in the more kind of pure philosophical uh, existential forum. So that's the basic idea. Uh, so, this is um, where the fight, uh, or the public fight at least, really starts with the publication in 1951 of uh, The Rebel. Um, I got that image from Christie's, that's the copy that recently sold for 6,500 euros. Uh, so, the dispute kicks off in 1951 with that publication, in particular with uh, a, a review in Le Temps Moderne, which was still at that time edited by Sartre. Uh, Sartre didn't write the review, um, but it's a, a very, it's a very sophisticated and nuanced, I think, and careful but overall negative review of the rebel. Camus replies in a very indignant and uh, rather high handed way, and Sartre replies to Camus uh, uh, in a in a rather high-handed and, frankly, long-winded way. Uh, uh, and then the fight just keeps playing out across other publications. As I say, my claim is at the centre of this dispute in 1951, which is where it all starts, um, is a disagreement that's already there in the relation between The Outsider, which was published in 1942, and Being a Nothingness in 1943. Here's Camus in an interview in 1945. Um, this interview is in November 1945. This is important, uh, as I'm sure you all uh, know. Uh, October 1945 was the month of what Beauvoir calls the existentialist offensive, uh, when Beauvoir and Sartre kind of launched, uh, took the word existentialism as a label for their philosophy and kind of launched their philosophy in an attempt to shape the cultural and political direction of post-war France. So October 1945 is when uh, Le Temps Moderne's first issue comes out, uh, which uh, contains Beauvoir's essay Existentialism and Popular Wisdom, which is uh, an account of what existentialism is and what it isn't. Um, it's also the month of, of Sartre's uh, famous lecture, Existentialism as a Humanism, which again essentially has the same task as Beauvoir's essay. Um, and in an interview in 1945, uh, Camus says this, he says, no, I'm not an existentialist. Sartre and I are always surprised to see our names linked. Uh, we have even thought of publishing a short statement in which the undersigned declare that they have nothing in common with each other and refuse to be held responsible for each other's debts. Um, I, I think Camus is slightly overstating this um, because I, well, no, I think Camus is right to say that he's not an existentialist and uh, is uh, importantly different from Sartre and the difference that he's referring to here is the one that's going to play out in the 1951 dispute. What he's over-optimistic about is this idea that Sartre agrees with him. I think, I think Sartre thinks of Camus as a bit of a mini Sartre at this stage um, and, uh, and is wrong to do so. I'll come back to that thought later. Okay, so when I say that Camus is right to say that he's not an existentialist, what do I mean? Um, I think it's really important, and this may be the kind of finickety um, distinction drawing of a philosopher, but I, I actually think it is really important to distinguish between existential philosophy, 
right, or existential thought more broadly on the one hand, and existentialism uh, on the other. I think existentialism is a, is a narrower category uh, within the broader category of existential philosophy. So, and I think this is the way in which Sartre would have thought of it. I think this is the way that Camus thought of it. Um, so when Camus denies that he's an existentialist, he doesn't deny that he's an existential philosopher. And neither do I. I agree with him. Um, or I, I agree that he is an existential philosopher. One of the reasons why he often gets lumped together with the existentialists is that these two concepts are um, often conflated. What is existential philosophy? Well, you know, it gets its name from this... Um, use of the word existence, particularly in, in Heidegger, existenz in Heidegger, um, uh, to refer to the kind of being that human beings have, as opposed to the kind of being uh, that rocks and plants and cats and dogs maybe have. Right? We exist, uh, in Heidegger's uh, terminology, this is, you know, what's different about us is that we have a concern for our own being. We care about the kind of things that we are. Most other existence, like chairs and tables and rocks and planets, and arguably cats and dogs, don't. Um, so existential philosophy is, 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 is philosophy that addresses the question of what it is to be one of us what it is to, to exist like we exist um, uh, what, what is it that makes us what we are um, that we're not gods, that we're not perfect rational agents we're not other animals and we're not plants or rocks or tables what is it uh, to be one of us and it has an ethical dimension it seems to me um, so it's concerned with the difference that the answer to that question should make to the way we live our lives. Right? How should we live given what we are? Um, it is an approach to ethics in the broadest sense, in the Socratic sense, of the question of how best to live. And it's grounded in uh, what you might call a philosophical anthropology. What am I? Now to some extent... Um, Secular Western ethics is always grounded in a philosophical anthropology, right? So Aristotelian ethics is grounded in the idea that man is a rational animal, um, and that's an account of what it is to be one of us. Kant's uh, moral system is grounded in the idea that we're imperfect rational agents, you know, we're rational creatures, but we're also subject to desires. That's an account of what it is to be one of us. John Stuart Mill's uh, approach to, to morality is um, grounded in the idea that we're all seekers of happiness but who have to get along with each other in community and that's an account of what it is to be one of us but I think what's different about existential philosophy is that it's not uh, it's not happy to rest with such a thin account of what it is to be one of us it's not going to say that look, this is just one cardinal feature of human beings rationality or seeking happiness or something like that that grounds ethics. Instead, it wants to ground ethics in all the dimensions of human existence. Right? What is it, what, what's the ethical significance of mortality, of our awareness of our own mortality, for example? It's going to be as crucial a question uh, to the existential ethicist. Okay, so if existential philosophy um, is an attempt to ground ethics in a broader uh, a portrayal of what it is to be one of us, what human existence is, what's existentialism? Existentialism, it seems to me, is the particular existential philosophy developed by Sartre and Beauvoir, i.e. their ethics grounded in their philosophical anthropology. Why am I entitled to say that? Well, they're the people who took the word and applied it to themselves, nobody else did. They gave it that definition uh, and that, it seems to me, is the definition that a lot of people are working with when, like Heidegger, they deny that they're an existentialist, even though he's clearly an existential philosopher par excellence. Um, uh, Camus denies he's an existentialist, and I'm saying that this is what he means by this, that he doesn't share their account of, in particular, of philosophical anthropology um, that grounds their ethics. But he is an existential philosopher. He does want to ground ethics in an understanding of what it is to be a human being in this, in this sophisticated rather than uh, more narrow way. Okay, so what is then existentialism, a particular um, account of uh, what it is to be one of us that characterises the philosophy of Sartre and Beauvoir? Um, guess what? Uh, it's uh, a central tenet. Uh, and this is not just a claim of theirs, but this is what I think drives everything that they're doing, um, is this idea that existence precedes essence. I think that Sartre and Beauvoir actually understand this in slightly different ways. 
I think that over the course of the 1940s, Beauvoir persuades Sartre that she's right about this and he's wrong and he changes his mind. Um, but I think that, that this means that both of their philosophies in, in 1943 or 1945 or whenever, um, although they're distinct from each other, they do both subscribe to this slogan. They just understand it in slightly different ways. So they both count as forms of existentialism. Um, what does exist existence precedes essence mean? It means that um, okay, it, it can look like a, it can look like a flat, self-contradictory statement. Right? It can look like the statement that it's the essence of humans that their existence comes first, and only then they have an essence, uh, and that seems contradictory. But there are different senses of the word essence, so it's not a contradiction because it is in the Lockean sense of the essence of human beings, i.e. What, what classifies something as a human being, that existence precedes essence is true of them, where the essence in the slogan is the Aristotelian sense of essence. That is, um, the organisational principle of the individual that explains why it does what it does. Okay, that's what's preceded by existence. So the reason why you do the things that you do is not something inbuilt about you, but is instead, on Sartre's view, the set of projects that you've undertaken, right? and that those are revisable and changeable, um, and as a result they're not, in some sense, essential to you. Right? How deeply do these projects run? Well, they're not just things like you know, being a writer, being a philosopher, being a parent, things that you very self-consciously choose to do and understand that you're doing. Uh, one of his examples in being a nothingness of a project is staying alive, right? Um, something that you may not really even particularly think about, but it is something you don't actually have to pursue as a goal. Um, another one of his examples is the inferiority project. Um, and he likes this, I think, because it helps him to illustrate how bad faith is going to have to work. And the inferiority project, it's like the inferiority complex, but without the Freudian terminology. Right? So somebody who's suffering from the inferiority project is somebody who um, wants to prove to themselves that they are in some way inferior or in some way you know, put upon or the, the, you know, their, their difficulties in the world just because the world is unfair to them. And the way they do this is by setting themselves wildly unrealistic goals, going about them in really stupid ways, and then finding that they don't work and blaming uh, the world for their failure. Of course, in order for this project to succeed... It has, to, it has to involve a certain kind of self-deception. Right? You, you have to hide from yourself the fact that you're trying to fail. Right? Otherwise, the failure won't be a failure. It'll be a success, and that's, that's not the problem. Nevertheless, it's a project, even though the only way to pursue it is to pursue other projects and to believe that you're genuinely pursuing those other projects uh, and to kind of hide the inferiority project from yourself. So that's another example of how you can be pursuing a project which requires its own kind of self-effacement, requires its own um, hiddenness. In his discussion of bad faith, Sartre gives sexual orientation as one of his examples, um, and he seems to be suggesting, well, he is suggesting, that this is a result of the projects that you pursue, whether you're gay or straight or bi or neither, is a result of the projects you pursue. That's not the same as saying that it is itself a project that you pursue, right? But, it's, but it is grounded in the projects that you pursue, is all I think that he's committed to, even though it might not seem to be. And in his famous discussion of anti Semitism, and I think this is what brings out something that's in there throughout being a nothingness and is in there in the sexual orientation uh, case too, but I think it brings it out very nicely and very clearly. He begins his discussion of the anti Semite by saying, Look, I'm not, just in, I'm not interested in people who just have anti Semitic opinions or beliefs. What I'm interested in other people who seem to have genuinely anti-Semitic feelings, right? who feel disgusted by the people that they hate. And where, how do they end up with these feelings? How, do they, how does it end up with this affective tenor? Right? And that's what he's interested in uh, there. Uh, and again, you know, his answer is, you have the feelings that you have as a result of the projects that you're pursuing. So that's how deeply it runs, but nevertheless they are projects. Okay. So back to Camus. Well, now what I want to say is that the L'Etranger um, presents an account of what it is to be human that contradicts the idea that existence precedes essence. Okay. 
So here's the question. What is strange about Merceau? And we've heard a little bit already today about him being a stranger to himself. Um, most obviously, he's a stranger or estranged uh, or an outsider uh, as far as his society is concerned. Um, but I don't know about you, but when I read the novel, I, I find him quite strange too. Uh, I think he's rather strange to us. Why is he so strange? What's so what about him? Camus says, uh, you know, in a preface to an American edition of the book written in 1955, um, that, that uh, the answer is simple. He's, he refuses to lie. That's the thing about Merceau. He refuses to lie. Um, but this isn't true. Right? Merceau doesn't refuse to lie. Um, at one point in the story, Raymond asks him to lie on his behalf to the police, and Merceau uh, agrees. Um, so he's not only going to lie, he's going to commit perjury. Right? Why does Merceau agree? Well, just like everything else Merceau does, because he couldn't be bothered not to. <laughs> um, couldn't see any reason not to lie, so he did. That doesn't sound like the action of somebody who resolutely refuses to lie. So it's not strictly true that he refuses to lie. What does seem to be true is that he refuses to lie about his feelings. He refuses to pretend to have feelings he hasn't got. Um, in that sense, he refuses to play the game. He refuses to pretend that he was grief-stricken by the death of his mother, when in fact he wasn't. Um, he refuses to pretend that he loves Marie, even though he thinks it doesn't mean anything, and so on. At first, he can seem to just lack feelings in general, to just be quite insensate. Um, but that doesn't actually strictly seem true either. Uh, he loves swimming. Um, he loves sex. He loves... Um, the sea and the sun when it's not so bright it makes him shoot someone um, he's generally quite a kind of sensuous guy he doesn't lack feelings in general I think this is what he lacks I'm not going to go through all the fine grained details of why I think this um, right now but I think what he lacks, what's noticeably lacking about him are any genuinely other regarding emotions what he lacks are any genuine emotion, emotions of his own which manifest concern for other people's feelings. That's what he lacks. He just doesn't get it. So he doesn't understand why Marie doesn't like his answers to her questions. You know, she asks him at one point whether... She asks him to marry her. Why? I don't know. But she does. And he says yes. And then later she says, would you have said yes to any woman who asked you to marry them? And he says, well, yeah, probably. Right. And, he, and he just doesn't see why this is an inappropriate kind of response. Um, so I think he lacks genuinely other regarding emotions. I think this is what's odd about him. This is the point at which the presentation stops. Okay. Now here's a thing about the outsider. It's published at the same time as the Myth of Sisyphus, and it's and it's intended. The Myth of Sisyphus has a number of um, examples of absurd heroes in it and, and The Outsider is clearly intended as one of those examples but in a much more extended form um, when he starts to introduce his examples of absurd heroes, Camus says this he says, do I need to develop the idea that an example is not necessarily an example to be followed, even less so if possible in the absurd world and that these illustrations are not therefore models right? so an illustration of an absurd hero is not necessarily a role model in Camus um, view. Uh, and I think that's very important. I don't think he thinks of Merceau as a role model entirely, though in some aspects perhaps he does. I'll say a bit more about that in a bit. But it's important um, not to see them simply as role models. Okay. So that's what I think is strange about Merceau. Now, why is Camus telling us this story? Why does he tell us the story that he tells us about this strange character? Um, there's a lot of emphasis in discussions of L'Etranger on Merceau's honesty, but as I've said, he's not resolutely honest, actually. Um, his honesty about his own feelings, it seems to me, is just a necessary tool for the purpose of the novel. It's a necessary tool to expose what those feelings really are and his genuine lack of other regarding emotion. And that's the crucial thing, what Camus wants to show us. He wants to show us what it would really be like to have no genuinely other regarding emotions and to be honest about it 
So I think that one of his purposes in telling us this story is, as he sees it, to demonstrate the falsehood of psychological egoism, the idea that you're actually only out for yourself, the idea that's most, um, I guess, most clearly and, uh, and cleanly put in, um, in, uh, in the maxims of La Rochefoucauld in, in the history of French literature. So the idea that you know, ethics and etiquette are just ways in which we all pretend to ourselves that we're not merely self-interested, but actually that is what's going on. I think that he thinks uh, what he's doing is showing us what it would be like to, if psychological egoism would be true, and the fact that we just do not recognise ourselves in the character of Merceau is his rhetorical point in presenting us with Merceau. Um, he wants to show us instead um, that it is part of human nature to care about the people around one, to have genuinely other regarding emotions um, and that's why Merceau is an outsider. Why does Camus tell this? is a second slide on why Camus tells us this story. Not, this isn't a story. Uh, so this is the other aspect of L'Etranger, um, which is that, as I say, it's an accompaniment to the myth of Sisyphus. Um, uh, Camus wants to present an extended case of a hero of absurdity. What is a hero of absurdity? It's somebody who recognises the two truths which together constitute absurdity and doesn't sacrifice one of them for the other. The two truths are that human beings long for objective order and meaning, and that there isn't any, so that longing will be frustrated. Right. Nihilism um, is the denial of one of those, right, it's pretending you don't long for objective order and meaning and value, and just affirming that, that there isn't any. Um, that's not absurdism. Right? Absurdism is affirming both. I think, or at least that's what Merceau, uh, uh, Camus thinks, and that's what he makes Merceau recognise. So this is a contradiction of the basic idea of existentialism. So we've already seen that um, Camus thinks that it's part of human nature to have genuinely other regarding emotions. That clearly contradicts the idea of existence precedes essence, right, because it's a human nature. And here's a second contradiction of the idea of existence precedes essence, that human beings have this longing for objective order, which is essential to human nature. On the Sartre in picture, you could just give it up, right? It's just a project. Um, can we think you can't give it up? It's essential to what it is to be human. That's why the hero of absurdity is somebody who recognises it and tries to encompass both it and the necessary frustration of it in their life. So these works in 1942, published obviously before being in nothingness and, and obviously longer in gestation than, than, than his knowledge of, of Sartre, um, flatly contradict um, the central tenet of existentialism. Okay. So, back to the rebel and the dispute over this. Um, so, the, 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 the dispute centres on what Camus says in The Rebel about the role of murder as a political means, is how he puts it. It's sometimes glossed as political violence, but he, he's quite clear that he wants to use the word murder. Um, and over what Camus sees as a totalitarian direction in which um, left-wing and radical politics is moving at the time. I think the dispute um, is grounded in this philosophical disagreement. Camus sees the move towards totalitarian politics and the idea that murder can be a a justifiable means to an end simply as an expression of that longing for order which will be frustrated right? so he thinks that um, it's just one way of denying the absurd is to, is to emphasise the, the, the longing for order and ignore the fact that it's necessarily frustrated but he also thinks that um, our human nature as involving other regarding emotions, that is that by nature we generally uh, care about the people around us at least, um, is something that grounds a value of other people which is just denied by treating them as a means to an end, uh, a means to a political end, by killing them as a means to a political end. So he thinks that it's uh, a doomed project which denies the basic value uh, 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 of hu uh, grounded in human nature. Now, obviously, Sartre doesn't think that because um, he doesn't think there is such a thing as uh, a natural uh, longing for order of human beings, and he doesn't think there's such a thing as a human nature that would ground value. 
So for Sartre, political violence is just what's necessary to create the material conditions for the expression of human freedom, um, and there are no other values to respect. That's at the nub, I think, at the crux of the argument. So, to come back to the final point, um, in his response to Camus' response to Jensen's review of Camus, um, Sartre says quite early on this. Right? He's saying that you know, Camus has abandoned his existentialist principles. He says, where is Merceau, Camus? Where is Sisyphus? Where today are those Trotskyites who preached permanent revolution? Without doubt, assassinated or exiled. Um, to which I want to reply, au contraire, Jean-Paul. Uh, they are alive and well and living in the pages of the rebel. Um, they just never were Trotskyite preachers of permanent revolution. Thank you.